G'day guys, Jason here and welcome back to my fish room. So a couple of weeks ago I posted a video of my Lamprologus Ocelatus Gold Tank. In that video I showed some footage of the general behaviour of the fish, them spawning and them raising their fry. And you can watch that video right here. However today I thought I'd do a bit of an in-depth species profile into the fish, including what I do to raise the young up into adulthood, how I get them to breed and how I raise their fry. So why don't we take a look and see what I do. So guys, the name of these fish is a bit of a tongue twister, Lamprologus ocellatus, but I like to call them Ockies, and that's what they're known as in the aquarium hobby. Uh, they're, they're small shell dwelling cichlid that are only found in a lake in Africa, and that lake is Lake Tanganyika. There are a couple variants of these fish found in the lake, however the variety I have are obviously the gold type, and these are the most commonly seen Lamprologus ocellatus variant in the aquarium hobby. There are also a blue variant, which is rare to come by, as well as a black. However, the black variant is more commonly known as Lamprologus speciosus, and in my opinion, is a stunning looking fish. So you can see the beautiful colour these little fish have. They're gold bodies with iridescent purple-blue flanks down their sides. They have huge eyes for the size of their bodies, and almost look like little aliens. Uh, there are, however, some slight differences in colour between males and females. Females have a white trim along the top of their dorsal fins, while the males have a yellow, almost orange trim. And this sometimes helps in sexing these fish at a young age, when they're still relatively small. Also, like most cichlids, the male's dorsal fin, uh, their tips are pointed, whereas the females have rounded tips. But this generally doesn't show up until the fish are much more mature. And also the males grow larger than the females. My males are pretty much double the size of the females but males generally grow to about 5 centimetres, so about 2 inches, while uh, the females get to about 3.5 oh, centimetres, so about a half, an inch and a half. So yeah, with Lake Tanganyika being the longest lake in the world, and the second deepest, it has very, very stable water parameters. So I try my best not to do big water changes. Try to aim for weekly 15 to 20% water changes, and monitor your nitrate levels. Keep them to a minimum, and I recommend not going above anywhere near 25 ppm. I age my water and aerate it for at least four days before I use it for my water changes, and I also ensure that the water change water obviously has the same pH, hardness, and temperature as the aquarium water. This is just obviously to minimise shock to the fish. So Lake Tanganyika, the pH there is very high. It's around nine. However, my system is running around 8.5. The lake also has very hard water and I'm using Seekin's Reflake Salt to keep my water hard. I only add the Reflake Salt to my water change water though. Do not add it to water that you're using to replace water um, that's evaporated from your tank. I also run the system at around 28 degrees Celsius, so about 82 degrees Fahrenheit. These guys are pretty aggressive to their own species as well as other fish and will vigorously defend their area in the aquarium. They do this by lowering their head, or sometimes even raising their head, slowly swimming towards their target and flaring their fins to make themselves appear as large as possible, and this wards off any potential threat. However, if you intend to breed these fish, I recommend buying a minimum of three to improve your chances of getting at least a pair, and putting them in a species-only tank. Now, they can also be housed in a community aquarium with other dwarf cichlids, and the best tank mates are uh, other fish from Lake Tanganyika, like Judodochromus, Lamprologus, which are rock-dwelling cichlids, or Cyprochromus, which like swimming in open water. I feed them a variety of frozen foods and high-quality pellets, and this includes brine shrimp that's enriched with spirulina, mysis shrimp, and daphnia, and they prefer those foods in that order. I found that they did not like the daphnia as much as they like the brine shrimp or the mysis, but I still feed it to them because they still eat it and it gives them a range of vitamins and minerals that they need. The pellet food I've been using so far is made by a company called Tropical. They make a Tanganyika pellet specific for Tanganyikan cichlids and these guys love them. When these guys were still juveniles, I would soak a couple of pellets in aquarium water for about 10 to 20 minutes before feeding. This would soften the pellets up and would make them easy to eat. Ensure you alternate what you feed these guys daily, just again to ensure that they're getting a wide range of vitamins and minerals that they need to grow into healthy adult fish. And these were the very first fish I decided to buy. I got them while I was still at the beginning of building my fish room. I bought four of these little guys in February 2019 when they were all about 2 to 2.5 centimetres long, so just under an inch. And they were attacking each other pretty much from the moment I put them in their tank. In fact, I regularly see month-old fry attacking each other 
flaring their fins at their siblings just like their parents do. I really wouldn't recommend a tank under 40 litres even for four of these little fish due to their aggression to one another. Setting up the tank you want to supply them with a minimum of double the amount of shells that there are fish. The more the better. I use escargo shells as they are easy to purchase online and they look right at home in a freshwater tank over say marine snail shells. They are also light enough for these little fish to move around as they seem fit. For substrate I've been using pool filter sand, you can use a fine gravel or crushed coral just ensure that the grain size is tiny for these little guys to fit in their mouths so they can dig and bury their shells. They will usually bury their shells so much so that only the opening is exposed like you can see here. Sometimes they'll also partially block the opening so that only they can fit through it while other shells that they're not using are usually completely buried and this stops competition from attempting to move in close by. Also, provide them with a few rocks between shell piles just purely to break the line of sight. This really helps prevent unnecessary aggression while they're maturing. So as you can see with my setup, I have them in a two foot by two foot shallow tank with two separate areas of shells separated by that large rock in the middle there. This is because the females will also fight with each other. When I was keeping them in my 40 litre aquarium, the male would frequently break up fights between his two girls. And it was very interesting to watch his behaviour. In fact, studies that have been done on these fish have shown my observation to be true. And I quote, Peacekeeping intervention by the males occurred in the majority of aggressive situations and were crucial for the maintenance of the harem. So guys, I recommend that you buy at least three of these fish to better your chances of getting a pair, and hopefully a pair will eventually form for you. As I happen to have two males, the dominant male would always keep the other male in the top corners of the aquarium would only tolerate one female and would chase the other female away but he, not as much as he chased that other male. Eventually my dominant male spawned with the female he always tolerated and this happened in June 2019, so about five months after I purchased them. This first spawn only produced two fry. It was, after all, their first time. The male had spawned with her again a few weeks later and I believe there were about six fry that time around. When I purchased the fish though, I was told that these guys only form monogamous pairs. However, this is not true. And one male will readily spawn with multiple females. I believed what I was told until I saw the male eventually accept the other female too. His first spawn with her produced about 10 fry. In fact, this second female routinely produced more fry than the first female, with each subsequent spawn being larger than the next. The most fry she has raised from one single spawn is about 30, However, fully mature females are able to produce approximately 70 fry from a single spawn. And that's pretty impressive for a small fish. So in terms of breeding these guys, I usually saw either of the females beginning to frantically dig. They would just constantly sift sand from underneath their chosen shell until they were happy with it. They'd just go back and forth, picking up sand, swimming to the other side of the tank, dumping it out, coming back and repeating the process. And this seemed to go on for a good few hours. When she's ready, she'll entice the male to her shell and she will get a black horizontal bar down the length of her body. She will then go to her shell and then sometimes the male will follow her in. If the shell is too small for the male to enter, he will deposit his sperm at the entrance of the shell. I've lost count of the amount of times they've spawned, but I've only ever caught them in the act of spawning once. And this is the occasion you see here. Needless to say, I have also never seen the eggs. Usually I find out that they have spawned when I see tiny little eyes poking out of the entrance of a shell. But from reading online, it is said that the eggs hatch 72 hours after spawning and that the fry become free swimming approximately 10 days later. That first day I usually see the fry just sitting at the opening of the shell and they never venture out of it. So I can only assume at that stage they are about 10 days old. They progressively become bolder and bolder with each day, venturing further and further away from their shell. However, at the slightest bit of danger, the mother will rush back to her shell, poke her head in slightly, and this in turn indicates to her brood to rush back to the shell. It is awesome to watch this amount of care from such a small animal. It's amazing. Also, because I have two females and one male, he spawns usually both in about a week of each other. And the fry end up mixing up with both females, but usually one female ends up looking after the lot under her care. However, the other female, she doesn't eat any of the fry, even though the other female defends her from her own fry. I feed the fry baby brine shrimp about two to three times a day at this stage. Frequent smaller feedings are better than one large feed, and that goes for most fish. 
these guys need to grow and obviously don't have the fat reserves to last more than 24 hours for a feed. So ensure you give them at least two feedings a day. You will also see them eating the food you feed their parents. For example, when I feed the adults pellets, the action of the adults chewing up the pellet and expelling it from their gills provides the perfect size fry food. But please don't rely on this alone to feed your fry. Give your fry their baby brine shrimp or equivalent fry food and also feed the adults their choice of food. Now usually after about two weeks since I first see the fry, the female will usually again commence digging. It is around this time that I notice that the fry is staying away from the female who has raised them with the fry now residing in the male shells. This is the first sign you need to pull the fry out. Any fry that ventured too close to her shell are now aggressively picked up by that female and are deposited far away from her shell. I've seen her spit fry out like this a couple of times. And when you see this, it is really time to pull the fry out. The longest she has kept fry is about a month. However, this is rare. It's usually just two weeks. To pull the fry, you can either try siphoning them out with airline tubing or simply remove the shells the fry have gone into. Be sure not to remove too many shells, however, or you may break the bond between your fish. Also ensure you have, obviously, enough spare shells on hand to replace the ones you took out. I then place the two-week-old fry into their own tank with 10mm PVC and elbows cut into small sections like you see here. These guys need shelter and using PVC over shells makes your life easier when it comes to catching your fish to either move them off to a larger grow-out tank or to sell them. It is at this stage that it is also very important to vary their diet and not solely rely on baby brine shrimp as their main food source. I feed mine crushed pellets that I soak in water for at least 10 to 20 minutes as well as other pellets specific for fry. Whenever I feed my fish mysis shrimp, I usually pop in the first bit of defrosted cube into their tank as it usually has the smallest pieces of mysis coming off first. I also would not let the temperature of their tank get below 26 degrees. I have found they'll just sit at the bottom of the tank at tets under 26 and are much more active at 28 degrees. So it's the end of November as I'm filming this and some of these guys are now pushing over one centimetre. From my records they, they were free swimming around mid-September so these guys are almost three months old here. Some of these guys already have the purple iridescence like their parents and some also have orange dorsal fins so these are the males. You can already sex them at this young age. So there you go guys, my in-depth species profile on Lamprolocus ocellatus. I really hope you've enjoyed that and found it informative. If you did, please hit the like button, comment and subscribe because there's more informative videos coming your way. Alright guys, that's about it for today. I'm going to wrap this one up now. Thanks heaps for watching and I'll catch you in the next one. Bye.